I'm Nigel Warren, and I'm joined today by Scott Drew, who is Senior Application Consultant for TTS based in the UK. Scott is responsible for uh, implementation, training, and professional services for TTS, and I'll be handing over to Scott in about uh, 10 minutes' time. Uh, the agenda, uh, introduction and concepts, is about 10 minutes from myself. I'll be handing over to Scott, as I mentioned, for a demonstration of TT Guide, and then we'll be join, uh, join up together to do questions and answers. Uh, overall, it should take about 45 minutes. Okay, so on with the show. The vast majority of us attending this webinar are responsible for IT training for our companies. So to a significant extent, whether our employees love or hate the IT systems uh, that we ask them to use is dependent on our success to make learning happen. So it should be a concern to us all that this recent report from IDC indicates that information workers are wasting a huge amount of time, up to four hours per week, looking for documentation needed to perform their jobs. And worse, that in 50% of the cases, that search is unsuccessful. So what's the impact of this on your businesses? Inefficiency, obviously, frustrated employees, mistakes that might include compliance risks, and ultimately, poor customer service. Inevitably, the process and system changes that your company rolls out risk worsening this uh, until employees master new ways of working. So let's consider the impact of uh, implementing and uh, changing IT systems over time. This timeline indicates a typical system life cycle. Systems like ERP, CRM, etc., are implemented, they're exploited, and then subject to periodic upgrades. Whilst they're being exploited, of course, there are modifications to the system, and some people's roles may change, processes may, may be improved and tightened up. And this is the nature of continuous improvement. So let's consider the role of training and support along this timeline. Firstly, training, as indicated in orange here, rises steeply in, va in value at times of implementation upgrade, but declines again rather rapidly. The sort of baseline importance or value of training is likely to be dependent during a business's normal phase on how many new joiners you have uh, joining your company or how many people are moving from, from one role to another. By comparison, the value that support delivers to the efficiency of your organization lags behind training. Peak demand will be after go live or upgrade as users need help getting accustomed to new ways of working. But in my view, the residual value of support is higher during business as normal. And that's because you cannot realistically drag everyone back into training or expect them to immerse themselves in e-learning just because they've become rusty with some seldom used functionality or because you're rolling out minor process or system enhancements. So this differential between the value of training and support may, may really depend on the amount of continuous improvement, as we call it, uh, that is going on in your business. Well, the trouble is that continuous improvement is hard to do well. It, after all, implies continuous change. And the need to communicate and support that change consistently to your employees. Done badly, it's likely to seem like continuous frust frustration. Will these people ever stop tinkering? Why do they keep changing things? I'm fed up of being notified of, notified of changes by email. So I think there's a wish list for people like us in response to this context of continuous improvement. What do we want? We want to alleviate the frustration on the part of our employees. We want to improve support for moments of need learning. And we probably want to reduce the waste of events-based training. We want to provide a consistent approach to this provision of support and uh, moment of need learning, a consistent approach that works across lots of applications rather than the stove-piped approach, which is different from one system to another. And also, I suspect that you would want to leverage existing content rather than having to reinvent the wheel. Which is why I think there's a definite trend in learning organizations towards delivery that is more self-service, moment of need, and collaborative, rather than training that is formal and planned. 
And this is the principle of the 70-20 framework that supposes that the reality for the way people learn at work is 70% through experience and practice on the job, 20% through their conversations and networking with colleagues, and only 10% formal planned training. Or more starkly, that only 10% of the learning that is likely to take place in your organization is truly formal and planned, and that 90% is experience and social. So why are learning organizations moving in this direction? Some aspects of this are certainly not new. The forgetting curve, uh, uh, which was, pi uh, which was uh, researched by Herman Ebbinghaus, uh, was way back in the 1890s, and he concluded that people forget roughly half of what they've been told within one hour, unless they've got the opportunity of putting it into practice. Now, whilst that may not be new, it's terribly relevant in the context of an enterprise software deployment. If you need to train hundreds or perhaps thousands of users how to use a new ERP system before you go live, then clearly many of these people are going to be trained long before you go live. And they therefore have ample opportunity for, to forget what they've been told. But apart from the issue of timeliness, I think that uh, organizations are seeking to escape the scheduling nightmare that comes from having to train hundreds of people. And that's clearly a good reason to move towards the 70-20-10 model. Lastly, the main risk factor, in my view, is something that I call the domino effect. So what do I mean by the domino effect? Well, quite simply, that in an IT training project, training is the last piece of the domino to click into place. If the project schedule slips in any way, it's good old training that will, that will get squeezed at the end of the project plan. Because uh, very often, in, indeed, the go-live date is fixed in the calendar. So plan A may have been that you'll train everyone thoroughly. And plan B becomes, oh, well, we'll just have to deliver as much as we can in half the time. Your training plan might be further derailed by late availability of the training system so that you're unable to finish the uh, uh, development of training materials. Last minute changes to the scope of the project. Uh, very often we see postponement of features or modules to a later phase. And any number of communication breakdowns uh, can happen between a technical team and trainers. I also witness a lot of TNA guesswork because very often the implementation of something like SAP or Oracle or other wide-scale systems it, it is at the same time as remodeling the organization, perhaps work moving offshore or into shared service centers. So don't be surprised if people can't actually tell you exactly what it is that each role will be performing. It may be highly sensitive and political. The last and uh, perhaps uh, most important factor is that very often training materials become redundant. They're delivered once and then discarded. So take as a, an analogy the split chart. A typical IT training project is dependent on lovingly prepared training content. It may be extremely high quality, and that is what is represented on the split chart. But it is dependent on three legs, being the trainers, the system, that may be an IT, uh, an SAP training client, or a, 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 an instance of Oracle or such like, and then of course the classrooms in which you deliver the training. The trouble is that beyond go live, very often, one, two, or perhaps all three of those legs may fall off your flip chart. Trainers may have been uh, project staff co-opted onto the project from uh, the business, and they go back to their business roles. They may have been consultants who leave the business uh, once you're successfully go, uh, have uh, gone, gone live. Classrooms aren't in the right place for moment of need training. They're not uh, a solution for uh, moment of need learning. And the training system may well get decommissioned by IT because it's not being used all the time. So there you have it. Even though you had some fantastic training materials, they're liable to be um, consigned to the waste bin to some, some degree once those three legs fall off the flip chart. So plenty of reasons to look for a way of doing rather more in the way of performance support, rather more in the way of uh, moment of need learning uh, than the, the old school. 
So we're going to look at TG Guide. It's a performance support solution that can help you address many of these issues because it provides context-sensitive help that works for multiple, multiple applications on a screen-specific basis. TT Guide is, in my view, different to typical documentation and e-learning products. And by analogy, I have on the screen uh, a SatNav. A SatNav does not provide you a lesson or a simulation on how to drive. It actually supports you in the task at hand. It helps you get from A to B. And that's really the principle between, uh, sorry, the principle of TT Guide. A couple of other important things to mention about it is that it needs to be fast uh, so that uh, people do not have to wait for help. And that involves very small file sizes. It needs to be easy to create the topics so that you can delegate responsibility to a vast number of content creators, such as subject matter experts, uh, to get the job done quickly. And it needs to be responsive to change. Uh, for example, uh, users can rate um, the content and provide feedback and improvement suggestions. So those are the principles of the product. And I'd now like to uh, hand over to Scott, who will actually take us through a quick demonstration uh, of TT Guide. Thank you. OK, thank you. Uh, thank you, Nigel, for that. So what I want to do is, around the next sort of 15 to 20 minutes, I want to provide some um, context and meaning behind what I'm going to cover. So what I have on this screen is I have a variety of different users, and I guess uh, a variety of different functions that those users will carry out. Um, what I'll do is, at the end of each of the demonstration sections, we'll revisit um, each of these areas um, before we then proceed to the next role within the system. So what we'll do at the beginning is start with the end user. So we'll look at the process of how we search for guides, um, complete various tasks, and then submit feedback. Um, I guess the next natural question in our minds might be, well, we've consumed the data. How do we go through the process of actually creating that data on the system? We'll have a look at that. And then finally, to sort of tie the workflow process in together, um, is to look at really the process of how the administrator would then go in and make um, changes to the guide and release it to the uh, to the user base. Okay, so what I want to do is I want to just um, bring TT Guide to life through a variety of different scenarios, and, and maybe these are scenarios that you may have encountered yourself within your own organisation. So. Let's keep in the back of our mind that um, we're an employee, and as an employee, we've um, suddenly developed a chip in the windscreen of our company car. And what we want to do is we want to make sure that we are reporting it to the organization in the, uh, in the right sort of way. So we've got a variety of options here. So what we can do is we can say, well, actually, maybe we go ahead and contact the help desk, but often help desks are inundated with other support calls. Um, but it might be a case that we remember, we mem remember a colleague uh, had also experienced a similar issue, uh, and they told us that it was actually within SAP. So TT Guide sits within our system tray at the, uh, the bottom side of the screen here. So I'm just hanging my mouse over the top of that. Now, to gain access to the guide, all I do is I just go ahead and click on it. And what the guide will do is, when I click on the guide, depending on what application I'm currently in, it will provide me with context-sensitive information. So as I'm starting to change to these various different applications, if you notice what the guide is doing is it's updating in accordance with that screen that I'm currently on, with the application that I'm currently in at the moment. Um, and I guess a challenge that many of us find within an organization is when we're looking for things like help and we press F1 on a keyboard within Microsoft, for example, sometimes it's a fairly extensive process and it can cause some frustration for us to find that information. The great thing about Guide is, is that it's providing context-level le information um, in accordance with the application that we're in as well. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I just want to go ahead and um, have a look for a specific guide. So it could be a case that I'm saying, well, actually, in reality, I don't really know which specific guide I'm looking for. I know I have a fault on my company car. I now have a, a chip in the windscreen. Um, but how do I make sure that I'm entering the correct information. So what I can do is I can take advantage of a variety of keywords, meaningful keywords that I can associate to these different guides in the list here. So in reality, it could be a case that I'm saying, well, actually, it's, um, you know, it's broken, it's a windscreen, or maybe even use the word fault, for example. So as I start to key in the word fault, very much like Google, 
what it's doing is it's providing an autofill of the information that you see on the screen here. So what I'm going to do is just to select the fault uh, on the screen now, and it's updated the guide accordingly, which is what we see here. The other thing to note as well is when I hang my, my mouse over the top of the information that's being displayed to me following my search result, is it's giving me an idea as to how often this guide has been rated, how often it's been downloaded. Um, so the way the search window works is the most highly rated guides are displayed at the top of the search window, whereas the lower rated ones are displayed um, further down the window. It also provides me the, with a brief synopsis of what the guide is about, so at least then it helps me to understand whether I've selected the right guide as well on the screen. So in this case, as a user, what we're going to do is just to select this malfunction report. Now, a few things to note on the screen here. Um, what TT Guide has done is it's augmented over the top of the live application. So what we're about to do is to enter information in SAP Live on the screen. And the other thing that it's done is it's also grayed out everything that's irrelevant to me as a user. So it's making sure that I focus in the right sort of way um, when I'm entering this information. One final thing to consider as well is we provide validation. So what you can do is you can really ensure that your users are entering the correct information on that screen. So as I'm starting to click on the wrong buttons that are outside of the instruction here, it's flashing, in other words, to say, well, look, Scott, what you need to do is enter IW21. Um, so in order to enter your windscreen chip, it needs to be put in this IW21 transaction within SAP. Now, I'm feeling particularly lazy today, so I can have the system automatically enter the information for me, so I can go ahead and click on um, enter on that screen. And the other thing to note also is, as well is, because I don't enter this very often, I need to submit a not notification type. Now, the reason why we've got the different notification types listed on this screen here is, if I just click on this option on the screen, there could be a fairly extensive list of notification types that are available. Now, as a user, I'm not really sure of which notification type to enter. So what we've done is we've taken, taken the pain away from that, and we've said, well, actually, we'll narrow down the list in terms of those different notification types. So again, what I'm going to do is just to select M2, because I know it's some form of malfunction in the system, and then just carry on um, completing the steps that TT Guide is sending me through. So currently, I'm on step 6 of 15 in the system. Now, the other things to note also on here are, as I'm starting to navigate through um, the various different instructions that are being displayed to me, effectively what the guide is doing is it, it's actually skipping over anything that is not relevant to me as a user. So effectively what we're trying to do is we're providing guidance to make sure that we improve things like consistency, we increase the quality of data entry, to make sure that people are entering things in a standardized way. So in this option here, what it's asking me to do is to go ahead and enter my uh, vehicle registration. So I'm just going to put a vehicle registration in there on the screen. Go ahead and click on enter. I need to make sure it's reported by my, oops, reported by myself. And, if, and, and uh, what it's also doing is it's telling me here, um, please provide a description of the damage. You know, tell us whether it's visible and, and is the item still usable. So this is really another good example of where we're trying to enforce consistency for when users are entering information into the system. So we're making sure that it's fairly standard and people are entering the correct sort of information even when it's on uh, a free text input field, which is what we see now. So I'm going to say windscreen chip. Um, damage, oops, damage uh, over driver side uh, is visible uh, and not usable. Okay, so then just go ahead and click on enter. Now, I also have access to some useful help options on the screen here as well. So it, it's indicating with a logo where I need to click, but if, for example, I'm still not sure of where I need to select on the screen, what we can do is we can access this um, fill mode on the screen here. And what that fill mode is doing is it's providing me with a brief preview of where to click on the screen. Now, if I'm unsure as to what this flag is about, I can take advantage of the live tool tips inside of the SAP application. So this has actually put in uh, the process. So we'll just go ahead and click on that. And then to just finally go ahead and save. So 
let's just sort of review very quickly what I've just done on the screen there. So what I've done is I've, I've as a user, um, there's been damage to my company car. Uh, I needed to go into SAP and I needed to submit a notification um, to instruct that, uh, that I have this damage. Now, the guide is telling me that's it. And it's saying the SAP system should now show you the appropriate number which it does in the live application on the system tray just down here. And the next step to go through is to just go ahead and click here. So once I've done that, what I'm able to do is I'm now able to provide rating of this guide based on a five-star rating system here. So I can just hang my mouse over the top. And I can also provide feedback to the uh, administrator of anything that I feel would be useful for other people to see changed in this guide. So I'll just copy and paste that in there. And what I'm saying in this case is, you know, the guide could be more detailed for reporting a car fault. I didn't feel there was enough information. And the final step is just to go through and submit that feedback. So after I've submitted it, what will happen is that information will be then sent to the guide base, which is something that we'll talk about um, a little bit later on. Now, Let's take a look at another scenario. So let, let's say, for example, um, it's six months down the line, and again, we've experienced another fault with our company car. This time, it's actually an oil leak. And again, we need to submit that into SAP. Now, we remember from last time that it's a, an IW21 transaction, so I'm already in the correct screen. But the only thing I can't remember is whether it was a malfunction or a maintenance request that I needed to submit. And this is where, really where the guide comes into play. So I can take advantage of the guide. So I'll click on it again. Okay, just make sure it's in focus on the screen. And there it is. So initially, it's telling me that I'm inside of the IW21 transaction. So I'll just hang my mouse over the top within the search window just up here. And what I want to do is, again, I want to go through and create a malfunction report. Now, there's something slightly different from last time. Now, the thing to note is it's now dropped me straight into step 5 of 15. So what it's done is it's it ignored all the subsequent steps because as a user, I already know how to do that. So what it's done is it's useful enough to drop me into the correct part of the guide where I need to submit that information. So in summary, um, what we've done is we, we've allowed the guide to help us enter a fault notification into the live system. And we've also ensured that um, we've entered the correct information also into the live system. And that's all done through using the guide. Now, one thing that I mentioned earlier on was I was saying, well, actually, uh, what I've done as a user is I've, I've gone through and I've submitted this notification. But what's the next stage of the process? What do I need to do as a user? Is it a case that I need to go ahead and contact Autoglass? Is it a case that I need to um, speak to my manager for approval? How do I know what the next step is? How do I know what to do? Now, again, this is where the guide comes in particularly useful. And one thing that we've seen um, a short while ago was, was really this guides tab, which is what you see at the top of the screen. And the guides tab is very much what Nigel was saying. It's very much a sat nav. It's taking control of the screen, and it's guiding you through what you need to do on a step-by-step -step basis. The other thing that you also have access to is the documentations tab. Now, the difference between the two is that the documentation tab is providing you with um, quick reference material on a context-sensitive level. I know that because it's telling me it's within SAP, IW21. And the other thing that we can also do is we can also provide context-sensitive information based on a field level as well. So what I've done is I've clicked on the notification type, and it's now brought up access to a glossary on the screen here. So as a user, I'm saying, well, actually, what's the next stage in the process? What do I need to do? And it could be a case that I'm saying, well, I don't really understand what the difference is between the malfunction and the maintenance um, request, that M1 and M2. So how do I, as a user, understand what the difference is between those two? And this is where the guide comes in particularly um, useful. So what I can do is I can go ahead and click on this malfunction maintenance. And what it's done is it's given me access to a glossary. Now, one thing to point out at this stage is all of the information that's being accessed off this documentation tab is coming from our main product, TTKF, which is a separate licensable component, and it's coming from um, the glossary. So some of you out there will already have um, access to this functionality. 
Um, but if it's okay, what I'd like to do is just to explain the way these different um, uh, these different options work to everyone. So just walking down through here, we have access to different process flows. We've got related documents with various policies in, as well as access to the original e-learning that we might have taken part in several weeks ago. So what we're able to do is we're able to bring in any legacy content into the system here. So we've got a variety of Excel sheets. We've got PDF and Word in there as well. But what I want to do is just to take us back to what we were talking about earlier on. So I was saying, what's the next stage in the process? You know, do I contact Autoglass or is it a case that I speak to the manager? So what I need to do is I can select this option here. And what this will now do is, let me just close this down a second, is it will now bring me into the web publisher. So the web publisher is an automatically published website. This synchronizes automatically with TTKF, the main server. And what we're able to do is as an employee, as the user, this is the stage we're at at the moment. So we've submitted this fault request within SAP. And what we can see is before we go straight to contacting Autoglass, there's a couple of stages here that the manager needs to deal with. So in other words, they need to go through and review the notification and send the approval out before we then go into, uh, um, into contacting Autoglass. So, and again, this is another separately licensed component of, uh, of TTKF. Yep. Okay. Um, and then finally, I just want to introduce us to the e-learning and procedures as well. So one thing I was saying was if we want to have a quick refresher on any tutorials that were created originally, we've also got access to that as well. So if I go ahead and I click on the play button on the screen here, what it will now do is it will now provide me with a step-by-step -step guide of what I need to click on. Okay, let's just go ahead and close that. So as I'm sure you agree, what we're seeing is fantastic um, reference to information that's available at the click of our fingertips. You know, we're not having to scroll through a variety of different help guides, and it's all available on a context-sensitive context, context sensitive, um, level on the screen there. So let's just have a quick um, breather a second. So let's just examine where we are in this process here. Let me just close that. So what we've done is we've looked at um, uh, submitting um, a help request based on fault, the word fault. And that enabled us to go through and create this malfunction report. We, went, we then went through and submitted the notification. And then finally, we provided feedback to say, well, actually, we think that there should be more information in there. And we based it on a five-star rating system. So the next phase to look at is, is really around the author phase, this second stage here. So again, one of the things I was saying was, I guess, naturally, the next question that we might be asking is, well, that's fine. We've gone through the process of consuming that. Uh, information, but how do we make sure that we're able to create that? So and what I want to do is I want to base this on a scenario that, again, maybe you as a business have, um, have come across many times before. So in this scenario, let's say, for example, that the marketing team have required us to make uh, a change to the slogan or banner within our email signature because it's a case that they want to advertise maybe a user conference or there's an event change or even to advertise a webinar, which is obviously what we're covering today. So what process do we go through of actually creating that? So what I want to do is I want to show you this in the context of something outside of SAP, because obviously what we've looked at is very much SAP based. So what we're able to do is we're able to log into Outlook here. And the other thing to note is we don't ring fence to any specific applications. So we support any Windows, HTML, Java, or indeed, which is what we saw just a moment ago, um, SAP um, based applications. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through the process of creating a guide. So to do that, I just double click on the guide here. And as an author, we only really need to understand seven different buttons across the bottom of the screen here. So we've got new, record, pause, close, edit, save to your local PC, and then upload to the guide base, which is something that we'll talk about when we look at the administrator, administrator at the other end. So let's go through the process of um, helping our user base understand how they make that signature change and where they need to go to with an Outlook to make that change. What I'd also like to do is, is to provide some example signatures um, as part of the editing phase. And we'll have a look at that in just a moment. So to carry out the recording, all I do is I just click on record. So one thing that you might notice, the record button is now red on the screen. 
And as I start to click around the different options on the screen here, if you notice, it's now providing a box around these different uh, items that I'm clicking on on the screen. So in this case, I need to go down to a signature level. Yeah. Just move the, uh, the TC Guide creator across a moment. And this is where I would go in and make that modification to my signature as a user. So let, let's just go ahead and click on OK. So that's it. That's done in terms of those different steps that we needed. And to go through and stop the recording, I just click on Stop, and that's done. And I'm also provided with a brief preview of those different screens as well. So as I'm starting to click through the different steps in the list here, it's providing me a preview just to make sure I've captured the right information. So one thing that I wanted to do was, as part of what we call the post-recording editing phase, what we're able to do is to include um, access to maybe legacy information. So I just want to show you how that works in here. So if I click on Edit Step List, there's an option here to insert what we call a smart link. Now, what this smart link is allowing us to do is, if, for example, you have any information that's um, being displayed on something like um, SharePoint, for example, uh, or maybe something in Visio or even PDF, you can provide a link to it from this screen. So my example earlier on for this scenario, I was saying, well, actually, what I want to do is I want to make sure that the users, when they modify the signature, that they include the correct sort of information. So just for example purposes of the demonstration today, I've just created access to a, um, a local server here. Let's just call it um, signature.htm. And then just go ahead and apply that. So the great thing is I don't have to publish this in order to see what it looks like. Um, I can just actively play it from the TT Guide creator screen here. So again, I need to make sure that the target application is in the right state. And let me just navigate through the various different screens here. And what I can do is just go ahead and click on play. And as before, what, it, what we can do is just to make sure that it's augmented over the top of the live application as well. So this is just capturing, uh, catching up in terms of some of the screens here. Let me just click on signature. So there you go. So it's also resolving that. So once I've done with that, what I'm able to do is I'm now able to go in and follow the various different steps just to go through and preview it just to make sure it looks correct. And then when the guide is finished, I, then I can then just go ahead and click on OK and that's therefore done. Um, so finally what I need to do is to save the guide to my local PC and then upload it across to the guide base and that's when we'll look at the role of the administrator. So let me just save that locally. and then just upload it across to the guide base. Okay. So, again, let's just revisit our presentation screen here and just take a quick review in terms of where we are in this process. So, um, what we've just covered is um, the role of reading author so as an organization, we've been provided with a mandate to make updates to, to various signatures because we want to advertise a webinar or whatever else change that we need to, and it's been mandated from our marketing team. So as an author, we've gone in and created a new guide. We've recorded a new guide within Outlook. Um, we've then made some brief editing changes and then uploaded that guide across to the guide base. So the next thing to have a look at is really the role of the administrator. So let's take a look at that now. So Let's just talk through what the guide base is. I'll just open it up for us. So the guide base is a centralized storage area for your various different um, guides that have been created. So the guide base is really allowing the administrator to manage content, approve content, maintain things like metadata on the screen, um, um, dispatch um, approved content to our user base, react to things like feedback, because obviously we provided some feedback before on the screen as well. So there's a variety of different things that the administrator is able to do. So once we're in the, the guide base here, what it's done is it's automatically populated the title on the screen. And what I can do is, under this description field, if I want to provide a brief synopsis as to what this guide is really about, I can do that under the description field here. Now the other things that I want to include are useful keywords enabling the users to find the help that they need. 
because it could be a case that we don't actually remember some fairly lengthy words that are in here. So what I tend to do is, is to put in words that are quite meaningful to the user. So we'll use the word email, mail, maybe signature, for example, on the screen there. Um, okay, so once that's done, we go ahead and publish. And I just want to introduce you to another slide here on the screen, just to bring to life what we've just done. So as an author, as a subject matter expert, we've gone through and we've created these different guides. We then uploaded it to the guide base, which is what we see here as an administrator. After we've um, published it, we then move it down to our user base. So when I click on that publish option on the screen, what I'm saying is, is that those guides are now approved and available for users to start using on the screen there, just to really sort of bring that to life for everyone. And then finally, um, I just want to introduce you very briefly to this reports tab. So as an administrator, if, for example, we've got a high number of low-rated guides on the screen, what we can do is that we can gain access to those various different guides that are rated fairly lowly, low in the list, uh, and then make the necessary changes to that guide to then resend that to our user, uh, our user base. So let's um, let's just take a look at a couple of other areas. So one of the other areas is is that how does the um, user gain access to the guide base? So what we've just spoken about is how the author or the administrator is able to gain access to the guide base. But how do we as a user look at the same sort of experience and look at the same sort of screen? So what I want to do is just bring us back to SAP briefly, uh, just over here. And what I can do is if I click on the guide, Again, it's filtering the list down automatically for me. What I have access to is this home option here. So I go ahead and I click on that now. As a user, what I now have access to is the guide base screen. So within here, I've got um, a visual synopsis of what this guide is about. Um, what I'm able to do is to navigate through these different options on here, and again, it helps us to understand whether we've captured the, um, whether we've grabbed the right guide. We can look to see the number of times it's been downloaded, how it's been rated. We can provide rating ourselves on this screen here. Um, we can download it to our local PC, ready for use. Um, we can create comments, look at any previous comments. So it's very much orientated towards Web 2.0 functionality on the screen. But if we want to say, well, actually, we think this guide's very useful, and I'd like to share it with you know, my colleague like Nigel, for example, if I go ahead and I click on this link here, let me just close down a couple of the other options on the screen. Just remove that dialog box. So what I'm able to do is I'm now able to go across and click on that link, and it will now open up Outlook, ready for me to share this guide with my colleagues. So again, what we're trying to do is to make sure it's fairly collaborative in its very nature. So, Finally, um, let's just take a look at um, that guide that has just gone through the whole process. So the guide that started its life within Outlook, it then got uploaded to the guide base, the administrator then approved it, and then published it and sent it out to the users. So how do we then gain access to that guide um, when we need it? So it, let's go back into Outlook on this screen here. If I just open up Guide on the screen. Uh, and what I'm able to do is to start to use my meaningful keywords that I'd included as part of that keyword search. So within here, we now have access to customizing signatures. Um, one thing to note is these guides are very, very small as well on the screen. So they're between 50 and 250 kilobits, kilobytes, uh, and they're designed to function within low bandwidth networks, um, which is a really great thing. So. This is the end of the demonstration. I hope you found this um, useful. And again, thanks for your time and attention. I'd like to hand back over to Nigel. Thank you very much, Scott. Excellent. You're welcome. So um, just a couple of slides uh, to go through before we um, go to the question and answer session. Uh, really, uh, three topics. Uh, do we have pre-built content? I noticed that that was a question we already got on the, uh, uh, through the um, webinar. I want to talk to you about uh, return on investment and uh, just finish off by mentioning a couple of words about TTS, the company. Uh, regarding uh, pre-built content, uh, we provide a complete library of 550 short how-tos, very similar to what you've seen there for creating a, a signature in Outlook, 
550 short guides for uh, Microsoft Office, both 2010, and we're just about to release the 2000, uh, Office 2013 content as well. So if uh, any of your organizations are faced with an upgrade um, to the next version of Office, this can really lower the, um, the cost of uh, training and introduction of that. Uh, the other thing is that we have full featured um, web-based training available uh, for the whole of Microsoft Office and Windows 7. Again, we're just about to release the uh, Office 2013 content. Interestingly, this, this content is available in 14 languages. Um, so uh, in that sense, uh, very much an industry leading uh, proposition. Now in terms of um, return on investment, you know, what, um, you know, it's, it's all very well trying to build a business case for something like TT Guide on the basis of, well, we're going to have uh, less frustration amongst our employees. But I think that uh, you know, your, the powers that be may need a more financially oriented uh, business case. So I have actually developed a spreadsheet which you can request a copy of. Um, and uh, please, do, uh, please request this if you're interested uh, via the uh, end of webinar survey. Let me just very quickly demonstrate to you the sort of things that are in here. Uh, firstly, there's a sort of guide of the principles. So where do we anticipate savings and cost reductions may, may come from? Uh, firstly, the time taken by employees to find guidance, the cost of running your support desk, the cost of creating support materials, reducing the amount of training that you deliver, uh, and then counterbalancing that is, of course, the fact that you would be licensing a particular product to deliver these benefits. So just to look at the sorts of things that you can uh, model, how many employees you have, what's the average salary, how many times a month do, do, does a typical employee contact the support desk, how much working time gets lost uh, when they're waiting for su uh, support, and how much of these support calls do you think that you could uh, divert to a self-service solution. So you basically drop in the values for your organization. There's various other assumptions there. And you can see that uh, you know, what would be the return on investment over, in this case, three years um, is uh, 402%. Now, of course, the, you know, these assumptions are, are not wildly optimistic, but these are fairly, uh, what I would say, industry norms for support products. Uh, most vendors are actually promising somewhere between a 40 and 60 percent reduction in uh, support desk calls. So this is on the conservative side. If you reduce these numbers to one call per person per month and only 20 percent uh, of support issues being covered, there's still uh, a return on investment of about 300,000 over over three years. So um, I leave you know you to consider that. Um, it's really you know, up to your organization to model what is reality for you and uh, what sort of savings you might be able to achieve. OK, we're about to do the question and answer session. But very quickly, uh, a couple of words about TTS. Uh, we are the European leader for talent management and corporate learning, uh, particularly in the IT and SAP environments. We have 10 offices across Europe, over 170 dedicated employees, and actually, uh, I think very impressively, a, an average length of service of more than five years. We're growing consistently year on year, have SAP certified integration, uh, important only if you're an SAP customer, I, I warrant, uh, and uh, over 400 customers in Europe, Asia, and America, uh, many of whom you're seeing listed across the bottom of the screen. Today's webinar has been about one of the software products um, that we have. Uh, Scott has mentioned the other one as well, TT Knowledge Force, or TTKF as we know it for short. Apart from that, uh, we provide training services, both from training needs analysis, strategy, development, delivery, administration. E-learning, which is in the form of pre-built e-learning content, such as the Microsoft Office content that I mentioned. But we also undertake bespoke content development projects using our authoring tools. And then in the world of talent management, we are a certified consulting company for SAP, uh, so uh, dealing with such things as uh, SAP HCM, or as I prefer to call it, HR, uh, dealing with um, the SAP learning solution, the learning management system, also dealing with success factors, learning management. So there's the sort of range of services uh, and products that you can get.
uh, from TTS. So thank you very much. Uh, we'll now consult the uh, questions that have come in on my uh, screen during the webinar. And uh, the first of those I think we've already covered, which was uh, do we provide any pre-built content? Um, so the answer to that is yes, uh, the Microsoft Office content that uh, I mentioned. Uh, the next question we have um, is that uh, we have a library of existing support documents. Can you help us leverage those as part of um, this solution? So I think that was actually one thing that didn't really come across in the demonstration, Scott. You showed us building a link to um, intranet content, um, but in the rush, I think we skipped over showing it. So I think there's a slide where we can very quickly make that point. Sure. Okay, so there's a couple of different ways of doing that. So one of the ways is to go through and create a, um, uh, an external link uh, inside the guide itself. So the great thing about this is if, for example, I get to the end of the guide and there's additional information that I need from um, legacy content or I need access to SharePoint, in other words, we're saying, you know, if you found this useful, you may also find the following information useful. You can provide a link on that screen. The other area to do that as well is actually inside of the demonstration here. So if I just select the um, guide client again, what we're able to do is to integrate some legacy content into this screen here under the documentation side. So there's a couple of different ways of doing that, a couple of different options. Thank you, Nigel. Okay. Yeah. Uh, another question we have is, can you be a bit more specific about what applications TT Guide works with? And I think I'll layer on top of that another question, which is very similar, which is if we can talk about uh, the object um, recognition. recognition. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Both. Both very good questions. So um, the system covers any um, Windows, HTML, Java, or SAP-based applications. That's quite a broad range in terms of what what it covers. Now. Um, to relate back to the question that was asked about whether it's just screen capture or object-based capture recognition on the screen, um, what I want to do is just to run a quick um, guide uh, on Outlook again. So if I just double-click on this, uh, let me just bring it up one second. Let's just create a guide in here. Now, if I click on the record button on this screen here, if I now start to hang my mouse over the different options that are on the screen, if you notice, what it's doing is it's pulling information out at an object level, so it's not screen capture on that screen. So what it's doing is it's providing quite a detailed level of information, things like names, IDs, and various other things on there as well. So uh, as I'm sure you agree, it's a very detailed level of capture that's happening. Um, this is also consistent with our main product as well, TTKS, and I know that some of you on the call already have that today. It actually leverages exactly the same technology uh, in terms of capturing the, uh, uh, the recording. Thank you, Nigel. Okay, excellent. Yeah. And uh, I think we'll just quickly try and squeeze in two more questions. One is, uh, you've mentioned TTKF a couple of times. Can you explain uh, what that is versus TT Guide? And what can, we, uh, what can we achieve with TT Guide on its own? Okay, all right, so uh, again, a very, a very good question. So um, everything that you see on the documentation tab on the screen here is all being updated, managed, and maintained in our main solution, in our main product, TTKF. So um, when it comes to creating these various different process links, if you want to insert any legacy documentation, or indeed leverage some of the offline e-learning that's already been created, that's all, that's all done through our separate product, which is a, a separately licensable uh, licensed product on the screen. Um, the other thing that was also part of the TTKF product was this screen here. So when I click on the process link, it gives me access to the web publisher. So again, that's another separate separate licensable component. Um, the TT guide is is um, is really this bit here on the screen, the navigation. Okay. Yeah. And I think this will have to be the last question. Uh, which is, um, I was expecting to see more collaborative capabilities. Uh, what's your strategy for collaborative learning? So um, I think, yeah, we've got a slide that covers that quite well. Uh, uh, in fact, yeah, I'll explain this. So um, the, 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 idea, the, the design principles of TT Guide are really to have a simple, lightweight product 
that uh, can really be used to, um, you know, create or, or have the capability of creating guides using a mass number of authors. Um, so all of your subject matters, su sorry, subject matter experts can be um, enrolled in the process of creating a library of support content. And that's really the only way you can, in my way, uh, to my way of thinking, create a, a massive amount of content in a quick period of time. So we wanted to keep the product simple. Um, and there, there are so many different social collaboration platforms on the market. There's Yammer, uh, there's Chatter, uh, there's um, you know, SharePoint to an extent itself, um, there's uh, Tibber, there's, there's various others. Now, these social platforms are brilliant, but what would equally be brilliant, I think, is the ability to embed links in those sorts of platforms. So if people are discussing or looking for help, uh, and the answer is best uh, provided by uh, a demonstration or a guided tour of how to do something, then why not just put a link in to that social platform that launches TT Guide? Uh, and that, I think, is the sort of best of both, both worlds. So we really concentrate in, on a, a simple, clean product that is really quick and accurate to capture screens uh, and, and create this sort of guidance and leave social platforms to do what they're best at. Right, so uh, with that said, uh, we've reached almost the top of the hour. So I wanted to just say thank you very much indeed for attending. Um, possible next steps and who to contact. Um, I'd like to thank Skillset for inviting so many of their uh, customers to today's webinar. So if you uh, came to this webinar through Skillset and you have questions such as we see on the screen here, please um, go back to Skillset. You might be interested in requesting a proof of concept, so we show you how this works for your particular software environment. You want, might want to request the return on investment spreadsheet, um, and you can do that by the survey in a moment. Uh, you may be interested to know that we have other webinars uh, that we'll be scheduling in September onwards, uh, where you can find out more about uh, TT Knowledge Force, and uh, we'll look at particular uh, scenarios for using Office Guides as well. So we hope that uh, you may join us on one of those webinars. And that's our time done, so thank you very much indeed for your attention. And uh, the webinar will now end, and please uh, do complete the survey. We'd love your feedback, and uh, also uh, we look forward to hearing from you. So thank you very much.